back then, uh, the, the scripture that seemed to be very special to people, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And, you know, that's what we need every day, isn't it? <laughs> no matter what's going on around us. So thanks for coming out. Good to see you. Someone, uh, when we came in, I think Mary said, uh, looks like you're going to be preaching to the choir today. <laughs> but after hearing us all sing, I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> but uh, thanks for trying. Nice, nice try. It's kind of hard when you're used to the, the piano and the organ, isn't it? We really miss that. But um, no, you did fine. Let's, uh, let's turn to Colossians chapter 3. It's like uh, Harlan Shriver used to say, uh, said, a guy came along and said, uh, cheer up, things could be worse. And he said, so I cheered up, and sure enough, things got worse. <laughs> oh. Well, like another, another, another guy said, if you can't laugh at yourself, then just laugh at someone else. <laughs> All right. Enough of that. Colossians chapter 3. This is one of those messages I wish I didn't have to preach. It, it, you ever come to, someone said, you're preaching to most of the preachers here today. And uh, you ever come to that passage and you think, ah, oh man, <laughs> what am I going to do with that? And, um, and yet then I, I always, every time when that happens, I think of the Apostle Paul when he met with the Ephesian elders. And he says, I, I've not kept back anything from you. Uh, I preached the whole counsel of God, and, and uh, boy, how important that is. Our subject today isn't, isn't one of those fun subjects. The subject today has to do largely with immorality. And uh, I certainly hope that that's not a, a need in your life to be admonished for immorality, but if it is, hey, if the shoe fits, wear it. And uh, I find that these kinds of problems are more, more common than you might think. And uh, boy, in this day and age, when uh, immorality is just a, it's a click or two away on your computer, it's on billboards, it's on at the grocery. I always thought the grocery store checkout should be a safe space, right? But uh, some of those things are, are just awful that they have. So anyway, uh, the Apostle Paul, of course, uh, hits these kinds of things head, head on. And uh, we're going to be seeing some of the things he brings up here. You know, we're living, I, I really believe we're living in the best and the worst of times. You, you've heard that expression. It's, it's the best of times in the sense that uh, we have modern conveniences and uh, technology and transportation and communication. But it's the worst of times because we have modern technology and uh, communication and transportation. It's like the, the things that that help us out in our lives also can bring hindrances if they're misused. And then there's the overall tenor of life in our modern society. There was a time when even unbelievers seemed to have a sense of biblical values. Can you remember that back in the good old days? Um, right was right and wrong was wrong. But things have changed, of course. And uh, back in, in my day, you know, I grew up, and I was born in 1956. I grew up in the uh, 60s. And the 60s, of course, are notorious for the reputation of being the real, one of the real turning points. I think there were many other earlier turning points, but that was a real turning point, the sexual revolution and so forth. And um, we look back on the 60s as that, uh, that awful, time and yet um wow <laughs> those seem like the good old days in some ways don't they um things have just continued to change where was the church while all this was going on well in a lot of instances and i by the church i mean the church at large uh the church in many instances just kind of went along with the world, and, and you know, you can look at some of the positions churches have taken these days, and they're they're just as bad or worse than uh, than the world around us. And so that hasn't uh, helped. But those churches that did take a stand in some of these areas are often labeled as legalistic, and of course that that is the case in in some instances. Um, but the church often has has just followed along. I saw I, I heard someone say once the uh, 
The only difference between the church and the world is the church is usually about 20 years behind. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's, uh, that's often the way things go. Too. Although I think the church is catching up in many instances, and, and that's too bad. Well, we're going to jump in here in uh, our text of Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 5. And what we're going to be looking at, really, uh, <clears throat> three major points. We're going to look at the responsibility of the believer in verse 5, the retribution of God in verse 6, and then a reminder of our past in verse 7. So let's begin by looking at the responsibility of the believer. Verse 5 begins, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Well, what members is he talking about? I hope we don't mortify too many members. <laughs> we don't have many left here today. But uh, he's talking about uh, the members of our body. Now, as we have been pointing out the last week or so, uh, chapter 3 is that turning point where Paul goes from the doctrinal, sometimes we call it positional, over to the practical or the experiential. Um, by the way, who knows what mortify means? What does that mean? Make dead. Okay, put it to death. Uh, what do you call the guy that handles the funeral, right? The mortician, and that's that word for, for death, okay? It's not a fun word or a pleasant word. But why does Paul use it here? And, and especially in the light of the fact that he's already told us back in chapter 2 that we've, we've already been buried with him. We, we've already died with Christ. We, we've already gone through that process. So why was he, would he turn around now and say mortify if that's already happened? And really what he's doing here, he's doing the same thing he does over in Romans 6, is he explains the doctrine first that in Christ you've already died, you've already been buried, you've already risen again. But then he turns to the practical application of that, and he says, now it's time for you to put to death certain things in your mind so that it matches, your, so that your life and your experience and your practice matches the fact that you've died to the world. So mortify, therefore, verse 5, your members which are up on the earth. Then he's going to start one of those uh, things Paul is famous for, and that is he's famous for giving us grocery lists. Paul does that quite often. Uh, sometimes it's a positive thing, you know, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. He can go through and name all those good things, but sometimes he has to name these other areas. And I, I like to bring this emphasis out because sometimes people get the idea that, well, we're under grace, we shouldn't be thinking about sin and worrying about sin, da-da-da. Yeah, we're forgiven. Uh, Christ has already paid the price. He's paid the bill. But does that mean uh, that God doesn't care how we live? No, that doesn't mean God doesn't care. He does care how we live. And so sometimes, just because we have a tendency to sort of whitewash everything and not really admit to some of the behavior we might be involved in, Paul actually starts naming it and showing what these things look like. So we're going to be going through that list, and it's not a pretty list. What Paul's going to do in verse 5 is begin with, the surface symptoms of immorality, and then he's going to work his way all down to the underlying root of the problem. And so we'll see that as he goes through this list. He names about six things here. Uh, so let's talk about them. Number one, he says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. The first one, fornication. Now, this Greek word, you'll recognize, unfortunately, we recognize it right away. It comes from the word pornea. You ever hear of that? Pornography. Pornographic. And again, what, a, what an ugly term, isn't it? It's just, uh, it's just an awful term, and yet it's, it's right here in the original text, the pornea. Now, actually, the root word that's translated fornication here, pornea, literally means to sell, and it's the idea of prostituting oneself. That's really the underlying meaning. Generally speaking, the word fornication in Scripture refers to any illicit 
sexual behavior. And wow, you know, these days, <laughs> you can hardly even define, well, what's appropriate without getting into trouble, right? But God has clearly established a standard from the very beginning of our Bibles of what is the only proper and appropriate and, yes, good form of sexual behavior. And he summarizes it, God summarizes it over in the book of Hebrews. He says the marriage bed is undefiled. That's it. That's God's plan. And God's plan from the very beginning was one man and one woman joined together as one flesh. That is the only appropriate place for sexual activity. That is God's word on the subject. Now, having said that, the Bible does distinguish various kinds of fornication. And so I just want to give you some scriptures that illustrate some of the various kinds. And, and generally speaking, the Bible distinguishes uh, fornication from adultery because God treats adultery in its own class. Um, you could say it's, it's a form of fornication, but it really uh, stands alone in its own class. And I really don't, probably won't take time today to, uh, to go into all of that. But I do want to point out some of the kinds of fornication. There's three major kinds that can be distinguished, specific, uh, specific kinds of fornication. First, let's go to Jude verse 7. Jude verse 7. Uh, the little book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation. Only one chapter and uh, verse number 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Uh, that's, a, that's a big one, right? Uh, to this day, Sodom and, Gora, Sodom and Gomorrah means something. Uh, sodomy is actually a legal term, even though we're living in a time when... Um, I'm sure it's on the books yet. It's on various uh, state and, and uh, local books. But that is the term that is derived from this very situation, Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's described here as fornication. Another kind of fornication, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, we would uh, call in modern times incest. And that would have to do with uh, sexual relations among close relatives. And here's an example that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is, as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And what was going on here was that a, uh, a man was living in sin with his father's wife. Now, it's the, the scholars debate whether he's talking about his, his literal mother, his birth mother. Um, sometimes a man, maybe he lost his wife and he marries a much younger woman, and, and it could be it's referring to, to her. And she might actually even be more the age of the son. But whatever the case is, doesn't really matter. It's still sin, all right? It's still wrong, and it's it's uh, incest. In the you know the Old Testament, we're not under the law, but in the Old Testament, God defined various levels of uh, how far you could go. Um, it talks about uh, you know obviously uh, immediate family. It talks about uh, in law aunts and so forth. It, various levels that you do not. Mary, obviously, someone like that, and certainly uh, fornication would be, would be off limits. So incest is one. Another interesting example, which is probably what we usually think of when we think of the word fornication, turn to John chapter 8, and that would be premarital sex. Um, you know, I remember growing up being warned in church and, and hearing messages uh, for young people to avoid premarital relations. And again, I mean, in the, in the kind of climate we live in spiritually and morally, 
you know, in, in, in the Old Testament, or when Lot was trying to warn his family that they need to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah because God's going to rain down fire, it says that the, the sons-in-law just looked at him like one who's mocking. You're joking. You're, you've got to be kidding. See, God's going to judge the city for, for what's going on here. And, and that's, that's almost how it is. I mean, you talk about young people, you are not to engage in premarital relations. It's like, are you kidding? Are you joking? That's, that's, the, that's the atmosphere that uh, our world has today. Well, let's just look at an example here in John chapter 8. And you got to look at the context a little bit to really see it here. Um, John chapter 8, when the Lord's talking to the, the uh, Jews, I'm trying to see which group it was. I mean, sometimes it was the, the Pharisees. Or, here it just says in uh, verse uh, 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Uh, and then it's talking about... Uh, being Abraham's seed, in verse 33, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed, we're never in bondage. Uh, verse 41, ye do the deeds of your father. And he's referring to the devil, verse 44, ye are of your father, the devil. Well, what was the Jews' response to that accusation by Christ? Well, verse 41 says, then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. Now, they seem to be throwing a bit of a slur at Christ as they say that. Now, why would I say that? What did a lot of people in Jesus' day think about his conception? I mean, she was pregnant before Mary and Joseph came together, right? And so I'm sure there were rumors circulating that Jesus was an illegitimate child, as we'd say in the old days. And uh, Joseph, obviously, was not his father. We know, we know the Holy Spirit was his father. And so they're kind of throwing it back in his face. Oh, you're saying we have a questionable ancestry? Well, we're not born of fornication like you were. And that would be kind of the slur they were throwing at him. But that's fornication. That was one use of the word, premarital sex. Well, that pretty much covers that subject, at least summarizes it. Let's go back and look at the second word. Isn't this fun? <laughs> <laughs> Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. And the second word, uncleanness. Colossians 3, 5. Fornication, uncleanness. Now, the literal meaning of this word is unpurged, or one alternate definition is not pruned. That's kind of interesting. Uh, in other words, there are, there are some things we need to prune out of our life, and they just haven't been pruned. Uncleanness. And again, it's in the context of immorality, and Maybe to get a little, little better sense of the word, let's look at a, a cross-reference where the same root word that's uh, used here is found in 2 Timothy 2, and we'll start in verse 19. Our word will be in, uh, in verse 21. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal... The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. That's the word here for pruned or uh, uncleanness. And he says it needs to be purged. And again, it's possible. In some cases, it's very likely. There's, there's people that are saved that have not 
pruned their spiritual life or their maybe their moral life or physical life to the point where they have simply gotten rid of some of these practices or behaviors or thoughts and sometimes it's a matter of, of physically pruning your life of things that are creating temptation in your life um, I have heard of people who for example are alcoholics who have chosen to drive a different route that they normally would because it's just hard for them to drive past that old haunt they used to stay at and hang around at and just change change your route there are times we simply need to do that prune your life of certain things the third word actually two words here is inordinate affection inordinate affection the Greek word here is pathos, and it means uncontrolled passion or lust. And really what that's talking about is the fact that God has given us normal desires simply to keep the human race going. Uh, for example, you get hungry, right? I was just, I was thinking about that the other morning. I was laying in bed, and my stomach started growling. Isn't that, isn't that, God's sense of humor that your stomach actually starts growling at you when he's getting hungry down there. Your body has normal desires. Um, sexual, sensual desires aren't wrong, they're normal. God put that in us to propagate the human race and to express love between a husband and wife and so forth. But when any desire gets blown out of proportion is when you have the problem or when it's illicitly applied and that's what this means inordinate affection affection is fine it's the problem when it's inordinate the fourth pair of words here now or that he uses evil concupiscence all right evil concupiscence i forget what uh, the new schofield had there uh, desire desire okay <clears throat> and again it's a similar word uh, having to do with lust or a, an, an over desire of something the difference between inordinate and uh, affection and evil concupiscence seems to be that this word has to do more with the underlying cause rather than the outward uh, uh, working but they, they obviously go together. All right, the fifth term here is covetousness, covetousness. And of course that means to, to desire something that doesn't belong to you or to oh, an over, again, an over desire. It's kind of building on all of these things that we've already seen. But here Paul does something, he throws in another word uh, a sixth word that will really kind of stop us in our tracks because it shows what he's really talking about there in verse 5. And covetousness, which is what? Idolatry. Wow, we wouldn't want to be accused of that, would we? And yet he's just saying uh, covetousness is one form of idolatry. Well, there's the responsibility of the believer is to purge ourselves of these things and put to death those things which might prop, uh, pop up in our lives in these areas. Now, that brings us to our second point, and that's in verse 6, and we're calling that the retribution of God. Now, here's here kind of a a different approach from what we often hear as far as the dispensation of grace. Verse 6 says, which, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now, I've often said, and I've heard it said by other grace preachers and not so grace preachers, that God's wrath 
is generally reserved for, or the word, uh, generally reserved for the coming tribulation. And that is one of the uses that's very, very common in scripture. Uh, in fact, the Apostle Paul makes a point of it, doesn't he, in 1 Thessalonians, that we are not appointed to wrath. And that in the context there, that is a reference to the tribulation. But there is a general sense that he's talking about the wrath of God, and he actually is using present tense. It's something in the present that he wants to point out. And he says uh, in verse 6, For the which things say, what things? All those things he just mentioned. The wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now, there are two ways, really, that we could interpret this, or actually two applications we could make. And uh, one, one uh, explanation, I, you know, deserves study and merit, is that he's using children of disobedience as kind of a general term for Israel, who was actually under the wrath of God because they had rejected Christ, and it was because they had gone into this, these various lifestyles that God finally ne uh, needed to set them aside, uh, and that's, that's certainly a possibility. But it may also refer just to the general wrath of God that's built into the natural world. Uh, for example, again, we're in the context here of sexual immorality. Um, again, back when I was growing up, what were the, uh, what were the teenagers uh, whispering about or not whispering so much sometimes in the locker room Oh, did you hear so-and-so has BD? Uh, and it's like you look back and those were the good old days, right? Uh, you could uh, treat it with uh, an antibiotic or something, I guess. I never had it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be clear here. <laughs> I was never in danger of getting it. But, uh, you know, that was like, oh, that was the worst thing, right? And then AIDS comes along. And it's like, that makes these venereal diseases look like a Sunday school picnic. Um, there is, you know, and that's not God specifically, well, I'm going to get that person, that person. No, God has built laws into the natural universe. Uh, if you decide to climb up on the roof of the church and step off, it's not the judgment of God that you break your leg when you hit the bottom, right? That's just you being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> or at the very least, not careful, right? Um, there are natural laws built into the universe. And so it may be that he's referring to those. But it's still true. You participate in these things he's just described in verse 5. Probably something bad's going to happen to you, okay? And that's just because you're, you're breaking God's natural laws. I heard, I heard a way of saying it. I really like this saying. He says, we don't break God's laws. We break ourselves on them. <laughs> and, and I'm not talking about being under the law of Moses. I'm just talking about natural law that God has built into the universe. All right. So there is retribution in that sense. But that brings us to verse 7 where he gives us a reminder. A reminder of our past. In verse 7, he says, Into which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. Now, why does he want to remind us of that? I think that's partly because we as believers sometimes tend to look down our nose at those sinners, you know, who aren't living the way they should. And Paul is just saying, you know, some of you lived the same way. Did you forget about that? And uh, aren't you glad God was gracious to you? Aren't you glad that someone pointed out the gospel to you and you got saved from that? Don't be so quick to condemn people for whom Christ died. And I, I think that's just part of why he wants us to, to remember. Now, there are things that we should forget. And uh, it's not in this text. It's over in Philippians 3. I'll just read it for you, or you can flip over. It's just a page or two back. Philippians 3 and verse uh, 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. 
And in that context, you know, sometimes uh, we think of that as, well, forgetting all those terrible sins I committed, well, yeah, good to forget that and move on to something else. But uh, Paul has also just talked in that context about how good he was as a religious Jew, right? Um, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, and, and that's also part of what he needed to forget about. <laughs> he needed to move on to what it means to be in Christ now, as opposed to that former position of his, his religion. So there are things to forget, but there are things to remember. And he's simply reminding them in, Col in Colossae and us that ye also walked some, in, uh, some time when ye lived in them. You know, when we're tempted to sin, I believe this is where this kind of verse really can come into play. And that is, when we're tempted, we should ask ourselves the question, why would I want to go back to that? Why, why would I want to go back to what I used to walk in and live that life over again? We ought to be looking forward to what God has for us. So how do, how do we as believers deal with fornication, inordinate affections, and all of these things? Well, I'm just going to give you four quick pointers. Number one is to make a conscious decision to do the will of God. And God is very specific here. Paul points this out in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. That's pretty clear. <laughs> That's pretty straightforward. That's the will of God. You know how many times you... People say, well, I want to do the will of God. Okay, here's an example. Here's one you can wrap your mind around. Abstain from fornication. Uh, a second pointer in dealing with these kinds of sins and temptations is to determine not to defile your body. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15. 1 Corinthians 6, 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. Wow, that's sometimes, sometimes God just needs to shock us. You mean when a believer partakes in fornication, they're actually forcing Christ to participate in that? Wow, that's that's shocking. And yet that's the illustration that he gives. A third way to deal with fornication is to deny your flesh the opportunities to sin as best you can. And uh, Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 13 and verse 14. He says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Don't make the provision. And then, uh, finally, dedicate your body to God. And a very familiar text would be Romans 12 and verse 1. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There, I got through that one. <laughs> But as I <clears throat> said at the start, these kinds of problems aren't that uncommon in the Christian world. And we need to pray for one another uh, in these areas as well. So uh, let's close in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for your grace to us that even when we lived and walked 
among the world, you were reaching out in your grace to each and every one of us. That, Lord, I pray that we might return that favor to others around us, to invite them to share in your grace through faith in Christ, believing the gospel. We pray all this in Christ's name.